The Psalms are a well-worn collection of songs, hymns, and prayers that speak to the human experience. Life is not a level path. In this world, we will experience joy, sorrow, anger, shame, love, jealousy, hope, and more. Emotions are a gift and a part of our God-given design. But how do we direct these emotions and keep our eyes fixed on God in the highs and lows of life? King David authored many psalms, and we will learn how to steward our lives well in the highest highs and the lowest lows as we study through some of his greatest hits. Well, welcome to church this morning, and as we continue our series uh, that we're going through this summer that we're calling a summer mixtape, David's Greatest Hits, uh, looking at some of the Psalms, I'd like to invite you to turn to Psalm 62. That's where we're going to be today. Psalm 62. If you were not with us last week, we were in Psalm 30, um, where we were reminded to trust this process of what the Lord is doing, that even in the midst of really difficult situations, we can be confident that we serve a God that will turn our mourning into gladness, where we can put off these these sackcloth and this this clothing that, that is marked by that mourning, that we can be clothed with gladness and praise, that joy comes in the morning, that that his anger is but for a night but his favor is for life. And we saw this process of how the Lord redeems things and how he works everything out for good for those who love him. Well, today we're in Psalm 62. If you're there, you can follow along with me. Beginning in verse 1, here's what we read. It says, Truly my soul silently waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a leaning wall and a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. My soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Surely men of low degree are a vapor, men of high degree are a lie. If they are weighed on the scales, they are altogether lighter than a vapor. Do not trust in oppression, nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. If you're taking notes and you want to write down a title this morning, you can write this down. The Fist of Faith. The Fist of Faith. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning, and I'll explain in in a moment. But there's a saying that you're all probably familiar with. If you are, you can go ahead and finish it for me. It's been said that you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. The the point, even if you haven't heard this, is pretty clear. Bringing a knife to a gunfight is being inadequately prepared for the conflict at hand. You're showing up and you are severely outgunned. A knife is a deadly weapon, but a person with a gun has an inherent advantage on you. He can shoot the man with a knife before the man can even get close enough to wound him or hope to throw it. And why do I mention this? Well, not because I'm concerned about your safety when you return to your car after church. Don't worry about that. But because what we see in our text today, what we see taking place is this conflict that David is experiencing, and yet we see him fighting this battle with spiritual weapons, not physical ones. Ephesians 
chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, speaks to the spiritual battle that every one of us is facing daily. When it says, put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. You see, when we try to fight the spiritual battle that we face each and every day, with a physical means, we're worse off than the guy with a knife coming to a gunfight. We're like the guy with the rubber knife coming to the gunfight. What we need to do is realize that the opposition we're facing, that the nature of what we're facing is spiritual, and so in turn fight back with spiritual methods. In our text, what we see David doing is writing from a place of faith in the face of adversity. And this is a constant reaction, response we see of David throughout the Psalms. And it has lessons for us today as we look at what it means to have a fist of faith. Now, let's clarify what kind of fist this is. I'm sure many of you are primed and ready with the opposition you find in your life to fight it with a physical fist, right? You hear the song, this is how I fight my battles, and you're, you're outside at the punching bag. That's not what we're talking about. Just as your fist, though, consists of five fingers formed together to create something solid that's a force to be reckoned with, what we're going to see this morning in Psalm 62 is five practical applications of a faith under attack and how when those things are unified together, it is a solid front to fight back against the spiritual forces we face. Before we dive in, though, and look at those, you have a heading, I'm sure, in your Bible that gives you a little bit of a detail about this psalm. Mine says to the chief musician, to Jadithan, a psalm of David. Now, we don't really know who this chief musician was. Some, some attribute that to being God himself, that he is ultimately the chief musician overall of the worship that takes place. He's inspired this psalm. It is for his glory, and that could be so. Others believe this would have just been the leader of the musicians that would have taken this song and and put it to music, and so it's the instruction given to him, and that's possible. What we do know is a little bit more about Jadithun. He's mentioned in Psalm 39 and 77 as well, and was one of the musicians appointed by David to lead in Israel's public worship that would take place. We see that in 1 Chronicles 16 and 1 Chronicles 25. What we know is that this was a psalm written to be sung in public. This wasn't something to be kept secret. It's not a song begging for deliverance, but it's a song actually of confidence even under attack. It isn't a cry for help, but it's a shout of victory even before the victory has come. But let's jump in and look at the first finger of this faith, and that is seen in verse 1 of chapter 62 when, when David declares, truly my soul silently waits for God. Truly my soul silently waits for God. The first practical application of David's faith under attack is that faith is silent even when under attack. And you might ask, how is silence an act of faith in difficult times? Well, instead of David crying out to those in power around him to see and respond to David's time of need and help him out in this situation of difficulty, what we see David doing instead is remaining silent on the matter and simply going before the Lord. It's because he knows, as he says here, and That from him comes my salvation, the end of verse 1. I can remain silent on the matter because I know who's in control and I know who's going to save me. I don't need to go tell everybody else about it. God sees and God knows, and so I can remain silent. Instead of trying to defend his name, to defend his honor and his character and his innocence in the matter... Faith allows him to remain silent because he also knows, as he says in our text, 
that he is my defense. God is his defender. Paul speaks about this in Romans 8, 34, when he says, Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. That he is constantly before the Father on our behalf. And David here declares, I don't need to defend my name or defend myself. God is my refuge. God is my defender. He is my strength and my rock. So I don't need to say anything on my behalf. God will defend me. God knows my heart and my character. One of the things that's so interesting and also somewhat unique about this psalm, Psalm 62, is that not once in the entire chapter will you see David make a request of the Lord. Not once is he asking of the Lord, will you stop the enemy or will you please make this wrong right? Will you provide help for me in my weakness? There's an acknowledgement of an enemy that is attacking, that is wicked, that is doing what is wrong. There's an acknowledgement that his help doesn't come from riches or those in high power or those of lowly esteem. And there's an acknowledgement that God is his refuge and his strength and that he will not be greatly moved. But not once is there a request. Because David understands his faith in this moment can, can remain silent. God sees, God knows, God will act, and he can be confident in that. Faith doesn't require words in this moment. Silence is sufficient because Christ is in control and in defense of his children. Is this the kind of response I wonder that we have when our lives are under attack, when we're facing spiritual opposition and nothing is going according to plan? Is it to remain silent? To be content in Christ's control of that situation? Are we able to sit in that silence, trusting by faith that God will be our defender and our strength and our refuge? This was the first finger of faith that we see David displaying against the attack of the enemy. And this isn't always David's response. David's a man who's typically quick to jump up and say something. When everybody's scared and intimidated by Goliath, David's the one to jump up and be like, who is this uncircumcised Philistine to come against the children of God? Let, I'll go fight this guy. Sign me up. Where do I go? Who do I talk to? He's, he's speaking up when there's an attack. But in this moment, by faith, he remains silent. But what's the second thing we see here? It's not just that his soul is silent, but that it silently waits for God. The second finger of this fist of faith is that faith waits. Faith waits when under attack. Lamentations chapter 3 verses 25 and 26 say this, that the Lord is good to those who wait for him. To the soul who seeks him, it is good that one should hope and wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Do you see those two together once again? Quietly, silently, and waiting for the Lord. For the Christian, waiting is a constant way of life. I think for the general public in this world, waiting is just a means to an end. It's that wasted space between where you are and where you want to be between who you are and who you hope to become, between what you have and what you hope to receive one day, it's just this empty space between those two things. But as believers, what we understand is that waiting is not just temporary moments that take up our day. It's a constant way of life. In fact, our entire identity as Christians is built and formed around waiting. Our entire faith is built around waiting. We're waiting for the day that our faith becomes sight, that we get to see God face to face and behold his glory. We're waiting for the day he returns. We're looking to that day each and every moment. But we understand nobody knows the day or the hour, and so we wait. 
We're waiting to experience that eternal life that we've laid hold of because of Jesus. And although we've received that salvation, we're waiting to experience it in its entirety. We're waiting for many of the promises and prophecies of God to be fulfilled in these last days. So much of the Christian life and identity is built around waiting. To be a Christian is to be someone who is well acquainted and at peace with waiting. This is why in your Bible, over 150 times we see the word wait or waited. It's constant throughout the scriptures. In fact, one of my personal favorite verses, a psalm that we read, Psalm 27, 14, tells us this, that we are to wait on the Lord Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In case you wondered how good we are at waiting, in one verse you've got it packed in there twice because that's how much we need to be reminded of waiting. Now the believer realizes that waiting is formative in the hands of a God who does not waste any experience. We serve a God who plays the long game, who cares about the long result and process of your life. And even in this chapter, what do we see David going through? But a shift as we read first that he will not be greatly moved, but then as we see this waiting go on, what does he move on to say later in verse 6? That I will not be moved. There's no more greatly in there. There's There's a strengthening of his resolve within this waiting process. It reminds me of another psalm, a psalm of Asaph, Psalm 73, and and the first 16 verses of this chapter, they're, they're marked by debating with the Lord and questioning what's going on. There's this struggle as he sees the wicked prosper around him and, and doesn't know why the Lord's allowing them to seem to have it so good, but the man of God following the Lord seems to struggle day by day. But there's this pivotal verse in verse 17 when when he says, Until I went into the sanctuary of the Lord, and then I knew their end. I'm sure many of us here today can relate with the first 16 verses of that struggle of Asaph, where he's debating in the waiting, where he's questioning what God is doing in the midst of the waiting, debating why the wicked seem to be prospering and why the man of God seems to be struggling. But when he remembers the Lord, the psalm of debating turns to the psalm of elating. It turns from a, it, it turns from a psalm of, of questioning to a, to a song of proclaiming that God is good and that my, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my hope forever. Are you stuck in that place of debating today? Debating with God why he's allowed you to be in this process of waiting for so long? Why he hasn't answered that prayer that you've prayed for days and weeks and months and years and even a decade? Debating why God didn't answer the way that you had hoped he would? Debating why it, it came so quickly for someone else, but for you it's this long process was still not seeing fulfillment. Well, I'd give you the same reminder that Asaph got as he went into the sanctuary of the Lord. Remember who the Lord is. Realize that if God so desired, the waiting could be over right now. He could end it all in a moment. It's not that he's unable to answer the request at hand. It's not that he needs time to to form a plan and get it all together to answer it. God could in a moment, if he so saw fit, end your waiting. So the question then is not, why am I waiting? Clearly God has a plan in it or it would be over. But the question should be, what is God desiring to do in you through the waiting? For David, this process was strengthening his resolve from a man who wouldn't be greatly moved to a man who wouldn't be moved at all, from a man who maybe naturally would speak out and would rush in, who's learning to be silent and wait upon the Lord. 
It's like what we read in Romans chapter 5 about the tribulations we face and the process of what they produce when it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance. And perseverance, character. And character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. This waiting process, the tribulation that we face throughout that refining process, it's producing an endurance. It is producing a character. It is producing a hope within us that is not possible have we not gone through the waiting. We could say it this way, that waiting is the furnace of our faith that reveals the things we didn't even know were there that need to be dealt with. It's been said before that God loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. So what does he do? When he sees these things within our heart, our motives, our character, our reactions that are not glorifying to him, he cranks up the heat on the furnace of waiting to expose those attitudes, those perspectives, and those reactions that have no business being in the heart and mind of a believer. I mean, let's be honest. Some of our ugliest sides and reactions come out in moments of waiting. No, not you, just me. I'm pretty sure the last time you were at DMV, it did not bring out of you praise and worship where you walked out of there going, I don't know what happened in there, but I just met with God. You walk out of there saying, I need to go repent. My heart, my words, my attitudes as I waited in line, as I was delayed, as they forgot my number, as I had to come back with more paperwork, only to find out I needed more paperwork. Waiting produces things in us we're not very proud of. Things that often we realize, I didn't even know that was there. But God allows this process to take place that we might be refined, that we might be molded and shaped and purified to better reflect His image. Like in the life of Abraham, the father of faith, the friend of God, called to be the father of many nations, told that his descendants would be more vast and greater than the stars in the sky, but then left to wait 25 years in the tension of the promise of God and the fulfillment of that promise. You see, God saw something in Abraham and in Sarah that he desired to work out before the fulfillment of that promise. A tendency to be self-reliant, to fold under pressure, and give in under the fear of the weight of it. Do you remember moments in his life we see this exposed? Moments out of fear that he's calling Sarah his sister to protect himself. Or even moments of coming to the conclusion that what we need to do is we need to impregnate Sarah's maidservant, Hagar. Uh, This is what we can do. We can help the the promise of God along because it's been a long time. We haven't seen the fulfillment. We need to take matters into our own hands. Let's just, we'll have a surrogate, but we can still work about this promise of God. Now, God saw these things long before they ever came out in action, and he allows this waiting season to reveal these things within them. Don't be surprised When God has you, wait. And don't despise your season of waiting. God is using it for your benefit. If I could use one more example before we move on. If you go to the gym and you hope to see growth and progress, if you're lifting weights, you understand that to see greater growth, you need to increase your weight. There needs to be a greater difficulty, an increase in the resistance and the strain upon your muscles in order to produce strength, in order to see progress. 
Well, if you want to see your faith grow, get comfortable with putting on more weight. Realize that this is the method God uses to increase our faith. In the same way, it's hilarious to me that we do this all the time where we pray for patience, right? Lord, make me more patient. And we think that what's going to happen is after that prayer, you're just going to turn into this incredibly patient saint, and any situation that comes to you, it's like, no problem, take your time, it's all good. I'm a new man, I just prayed it and it's problem solved. No, how does God increase our patience? He puts you in situations where you have to exercise patience. And I know half of you are going home today saying, okay, so I'm never praying for patience again. No, but the the method by which he increases that is causing you to continue to have to use it. He increases the opportunities for patience. He brings along another child. He says, you wanted patience, I'll give it to you. If we want to see growth in our faith, we need to be comfortable with waiting. But the third finger in this fist of faith we see here is that faith stands still. It's silent, it waits, but it also stands still. David in verse 2 declares that I shall not greatly be moved. And in verse 6, he continues it, but as we mentioned, dropping off that greatly to say, I'm not going to be moved at all. There's a standing still. God is my rock. I'm standing on this rock, and I'm not moving from this place. God is my refuge, and as I come into this refuge and find strength inside of it, I'm not going anywhere. How is standing still or waiting an act of faith in difficult times, you might ask? Let's remember who David is. David's a hunter. David's a shepherd. He's a warrior, well acquainted with fighting. Whether it be a a bear or a lion or a giant or an army of men. But he's also a fugitive, a runaway, a caveman, well acquainted with fleeing difficult situations. No, when David comes to a difficult moment, his response every time has been either to attack and and run forward, sorry to scare you there, or to flee and run and hide and find safety. But here, what do we see his response being? It's not fighting and it's not running, but standing still and waiting for God to move. This is not the natural reaction of this man in difficulty. This is the supernatural reaction of this man by faith. This is a man who has slain his tens of thousands of enemies. This is a man who was chief over these mighty men of God who are walking into caves and killing lions and taking spears from warriors and killing them with their own weapon. He's, He's well acquainted with battle. He's not scared to fight an enemy. But in this moment, he recognizes, no, the faith that God is calling me to have is not one that involves fighting. It's not one that involves running. It's one that involves standing still and waiting on the Lord to fight for me. See, he can stand still because he knows his God is always moving. He can remain silent because he knows his God is his defender who will speak on his behalf. He can wait because he knows God is working even in the midst of this situation. And he's exercising this faith. He's he's living out the command of God in Psalm 46, 10. To be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. David can be still and know he is God. He's in control. He will fight. He will move. He will work. I can stand still and hold my ground. It's the same command that Moses gave the children of Israel when they had been brought out of Egypt, but they find themselves now stuck at the water with Pharaoh and his army coming behind them to attack. And in this moment when the people just want to fold and give in and return to Egypt, they want to give up 
They're doubting God's ability to save them in this moment. What does Moses tell them? Exodus 14, 13 and 14. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. What did Moses say to do? Stand still. God's going to fight for you. God's going to deal with the enemy. God's going to part the sea and provide a way of escape. You just need to stand still. Maybe some of you find yourself in a place of waiting, a place where you feel under attack in your life. And your constant reaction in that moment is to run around and to try and run to different solutions and run to different things and and run away from the problem and escape it altogether. And God is saying, just stand still. Just trust me for a moment. If you would just stand still and trust in the Lord, you would see him fight for you. You would see him work for you. You would see him do the work you couldn't do on your own anyway. Just stand still. You see, it speaks to what faith is truly rooted in. When we see David saying here, entrusting himself to him who judges justly. It's a confidence that God sees the whole situation. God knows exactly who's in the wrong, and he will judge justly the wicked and rightly reward the righteous. But this is a much easier concept for us to comprehend than it is to live out. Now, this struggle has been around long before you and I. We see even in Isaiah chapter 30, verses 15 and 16, For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength, but you would not. And you said, No, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee. And we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. In a moment when God says, just be still, just rest, just be quiet and be confident in what I can do. And what do the people say? No, we're out of here. We're getting on horses and we're getting out of this situation as quickly as we can. And how often is that us? In a moment of difficulty, in a situation where there's some strain And a process of waiting, and what do we do? We run as quickly as we can, as far as we can from the problem, instead of sitting in that place and being still before the Lord. David, in this moment, he has a resolve to say, I'm going to wait on God, and I'm not going anywhere. It's been said that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. But you could also say that when the going gets tough, the weak start running. Those with little faith head for the hills. They look for any way to stop the waiting and stop the attack. But the true demonstration of a mature faith in difficult times is how long can you stand still and face it? What are we told the whole armor of God allows us to do in a spiritual battle? In Ephesians 6, it says that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And what's the conclusion of that matter in verse 13 of Ephesians 6? It says, Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. You know what piece of the armor we never read about is the back plate. You don't read about the back plate of faith because you should never be running away. He's called you to stand and to face it. You've got the shield of faith that you hold before you as you stand against the wiles of the enemy. Faith stands still even when under attack. Well, the fourth finger of this fist of faith we see becomes bright and clear to us in in verses 9 and 10 when we see surely men of low degree are a vapor. Men of high degree are alive. They are weighed on the scales. They're altogether lighter than a vapor. Do not trust in oppression nor vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. 
No, what we see is that faith has no backup plan. Faith doesn't have a plan B. Faith is all in on God, all in on His control, on His plan, on His sovereignty, and not looking to have to add to that or help out, as Abraham did, the promises of God. No, faith has no backup plan. See, David, in the midst of acknowledging who the Lord is as his strength and his refuge, he continues to also look and see the the weakness of these men and the wickedness of these men. He contrasted it at first, beginning in verse 3 and 4, when he's asking, how long will you attack? You will be slain, all of you. So he knows, I'm not looking to you. You're going to be slain. You're going to be dealt with. They consult to cast him down from his high position. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. He sees the hypocrisy within these men that their words can't be trusted. Their hearts can't be trusted. He cannot depend on them. In fact, he describes them as a leaning wall or a tottering fence. He knows at any moment it's just going to collapse. I have one of these fences right now in my backyard. Every year, I tell myself, I'm going to fix this fence in the summer. And then every winter, I'm spending it praying, Lord, just let it survive one more winter. It, It could fall at any moment. And David acknowledges that's these people that are against the Lord, that are trying to attack me. He summarizes them in verse 9 and 10 as a vapor that's just gone in a moment. And he reminds himself not to look to them for his trust or for his hope and not to set his heart on them or on the riches they can bring. Faith doesn't look to men for what only God can do. And he mentions two different categories of men. Those of low estate. These would be the low lives, those with a low morality that are willing to do whatever is asked of them. These are the, the thugs and the crooks. And in a moment of difficulty, he understands many run to these men to say, hey, you, you don't have a lot of morality. I can pay you some money and you'll do whatever I want. You'll, you'll go bring about a false accusation. You will go attack whoever I ask for some money. And he says, I'm not going to look to those men. I'm not going to trust in them to try and make my situation better. I'm not going to look through a dishonest means of gain. He mentions oppression. But then he also mentions not trusting in extortion and setting no vain hopes on robbery or even those of high estate, those high-profile individuals, those of great influence and power, those that he could run to to say, you have control over these men in this situation. I'm looking to you to, to stop this, to right this wrong. No, he sees no matter, high, no matter how high their place of position is, God is above them. No matter how much power they have, as he concludes this chapter, he recognizes that the power belongs to the Lord. And even the riches that David sees throughout his life going from a shepherd to a king may increase. He understands, I can't set my heart on them because they can be here one moment and gone the next. No, faith doesn't fluctuate with the numbers in our bank account. Faith looks to God as our provider. Faith looks to God as our protector. Faith looks to God as our good shepherd to lead us and guide us even in the valley of the shadow of death. It's his rod and his staff that comfort us. Faith has no backup plan in these moments. And for David, as he looks upon the Lord, as he waits silently before him and trusts in him for his strength, for his refuge to be his rock, so that he will not be moved. He says, I'm not looking to any other man or any other thing for what only God can provide. But what do we see as the final finger of faith here is that faith trusts in God's control. It doesn't just acknowledge the fact that none of these things will help me, but he also turns around and says, but with God, man, there's complete control. Verses 11 and 12, he says, God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God. 
Also to you, O Lord, belongs mercy, for you render to each one according to his work. David knows where power and mercy exists. The source of it all is only found in the Lord. And that God will render to each one according to his work. How do we see this played out in our lives? How do we see this to be true? Well, we see that in Jesus, both power and the mercy of God are at work. It is in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection we see the power of God displayed in its full glory. Just as Paul put in Romans 1.16, that I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The power of God displayed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But simultaneously, it is not only the power of God we see through Jesus, but it is the mercy of God we see through Jesus as well. Paul would also write in Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 7, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show us the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God who is rich in mercy, who demonstrated that mercy through Jesus so that on the cross we would see both the power of God displayed and his ability to save to the utmost, but also the mercy of God displayed in that Jesus would take our rightful place on that cross. And David, in this moment before the cross, can still acknowledge that my mercy and the power that I need in this moment to see through this situation, it belongs to God. And so I'm going to look to the Lord. Where do we look in our times of testing, in our times of waiting? Are you all in depending on God for your power, for mercy, for strength? for a refuge, for help and encouragement? Or do you run to others, other people, other things, other places to try and escape it? David's reminder to us this morning is no matter how long the waiting, no matter who the enemy seems to be, realize there is a spiritual battle at play and what you need is not more stuff, is not more power. What you need is to rest in the control of God the one who fights for you, the one who sees the situation, the one who is totally and completely in control. And so as I, as I invite the worship team to come back up, as we close our time this morning with a song and then a time to respond in prayer, I want to give an invitation to anybody who doesn't know Jesus who hasn't given your life to Jesus because that faith we talk about, that we can combat all the wiles of the enemy with, that we can stand against his attack with, the faith that allows us to to stand and be still and be silent and wait. It's a faith that is only found in Jesus and it's a faith that can be yours But you have a response in this. We're told that we must confess our sin, confess with our mouth, and believe in our heart, and then we will be saved. When people were cut to the heart with conviction on the day of Pentecost, because Peter told them, you are sinners, it's blood on your hands for what Jesus did in his death. And as they were convicted and they looked to him and said, what shall we do? He tells them, you need to repent. You need to turn from your sin. You need to acknowledge it, confess it to Jesus, but then you need to turn from it. And you need to surrender your life to Jesus. You need to give up control to him. 
You need to follow in his footsteps and acknowledge that what he did on the cross wasn't only done for you, it was done by you because we are all sinners. But when you confess with your mouth, when you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that he is God, that he came in the flesh, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on that cross for your sins and was resurrected three days later so that he can offer you eternal life, life beyond the grave, you can experience forgiveness for your sins. You can become a new creation in Christ Jesus. He gives you a new heart. He renews your mind. And your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. You are welcomed into the family of God. A person headed towards hell, now sealed for eternity in Christ but you must respond. Joshua would say that you need to choose this day whom it is you will serve. That's what the gospel does. It brings you to a decision, a decision no one else can make for you and a decision that you alone will answer for one day before God Almighty. And he won't say how many times did you go to church. He won't say how many verses did you read. He won't say how many people did you help across the street, how much good did you accomplish, or how many Christians were in your family or in your friend group. The question is going to be whether or not you knew Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And based on that reality, he will either say, welcome, my good and faithful servant, or he will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. And so I ask this morning, before we close in prayer, is there anybody this morning that needs to raise their hand and needs to give their life to Jesus? that needs to surrender control and receive the salvation that only Jesus can give you because there's no other way, there's no other truth, there's no other life except through Jesus. Anyone this morning? Well, then I trust this morning that, that you have made that decision. That you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That you've surrendered your life to him and in turn have repented of those sins and are taking up your cross and following him daily. Then let's do so as believers that walk by faith. Realizing it's impossible to please God without faith. Let's apply that faith in our lives as David demonstrates under attack. Let's be a people who by faith stand still when under attack, who wait upon the Lord for our help, who remain silent in that moment because he is our defense. People who don't look to another, we, we trust in the Lord's control. And who rest in the finished work of Jesus because by grace we have been saved. And as we close in this song of worship, my invitation to you is to, to sing out and to celebrate. Even in the midst of your waiting, even if you're under attack and don't know when or how the victory may come. God is good even when times are not. And even when you don't know what to pray and you don't know how to sing, we do so by faith. Allowing the Spirit to intercede on our behalf in these moments and walking in obedience even if the desire is not yet there. Let's pray as we close in this song of worship. God, we thank you that you are a God that we can have faith in and be confident in because you are faithful. Lord, even in the tension of the promises and the fulfillment of them, Lord, the tension of the waiting and not seeing you moving, 
The tension of being under attack and wondering how long you're going to allow it before you're going to intercede. Or the tension of, of debating why we're even waiting or why you're acting in the way you are and not dealing differently with the situation. Lord, as we find ourselves in that tension, Lord, we pray that you would increase our faith, that you would increase our resolve, that you would increase our endurance and our character and our hope, knowing that you're in control, knowing that this waiting is not wasted, and that you're producing things within us, you're working out things within us that are necessary, that are beneficial. God, in the moments we lose sight of that, would you bring our attention once again back to you, the author and the finisher of our faith. Lord, when we get so distracted with the world around us, bring us once again into the sanctuary of the Lord to gain an eternal perspective, to set our minds on things above, not on things below. Lord, we want to be a people like David that when under attack can wait silently before the Lord because it's from you that our salvation comes. You are our provider. You are our protector. You are our great high priest, our good shepherd. Lord, it's to you that we look in times of need. And when our heart is overwhelmed, lead us to the rock that is higher than us. We thank you, God, that you are a solid rock on which we can stand. A rock that is not moved, a rock that is not shaken, a rock that does not crumble and cannot be destroyed. You are our firm foundation. It's in you we trust. Lord, we acknowledge that riches can't do it, that rulers of this day cannot do it. Only you can do what we need. It's not by might, it's not by our power, it's, it's by your Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would cover everyone here in grace, that they would know your mercy today for those who have, Lord, been guilty of little faith in the midst of the storm like the disciples. Those who have doubted your control, who have questioned your ability, who have ran in times of difficulty, Lord, would you remind them this morning there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. And would you increase their faith today? God, be glorified as we sing out this song of worship. Lord, you are worthy of all of our praise. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. That is our desire this morning, Lord. That we would be quick to run to you, our Heavenly Father, again and again and again. It's in you we find our rest. It's in you where mercy exists. It's in you alone that our refuge and strength can be found. Lord, whatever we season we find ourselves in this morning, God, I pray that we would be quick to run back to you to trust in you. And whatever opposition awaits us today, our prayer is that we would fight it with spiritual weapons, looking to you for our strength and giving you our the glory. And it's in your name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. We want to give you guys an opportunity to respond this morning in prayer. And so there's going to be people available on both sides of the room up here in the front. 
that would love to pray with you. Realize that prayer is an essential part of that battle that we do against those spiritual forces. Please don't hesitate to come up here and receive prayer from someone who would love to pray with you. But as we go, I, I want to challenge you this week to, to be applying what we're learning within this text. And so something I'm going to be doing and I want to invite you to join along with me is, is to practice that stillness and that silence that we see David speaking to for just 20 minutes a day. To have 20 minutes a day that no matter what is going on in your life, what opposition you're facing, 20 minutes, whether it be in the morning or at night, that you're going to be still and you're going to be silent before the Lord. To allow Him to, to bring to you a remembrance of who's in control, that there's a process and He's working things out, but also to, to apply your faith by saying, God, I don't need to move. God, I don't need to say anything. You're in control and you're the one doing the work. And when faced with opposition this week, remember to fight with a fist of faith, to put on the whole armor of God and use spiritual weapons to face the spiritual opposition and having done all to, to stand in that space, trusting in a God to whom all power and mercy belongs, the one who will render to each one according to his work. You guys have a great week, and please don't hesitate to come and receive prayer. We'll see you next time.